Ah, there we are. We're recording. Hi, Martin. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, here we are. We've managed it again. It's yeah. getting, getting harder to, to find the space and the, the moments that work in the diary, isn't it? As things kind of, well, I suppose we've called these lockdown conversations and we're only sort of half in lockdown now. So <laughs> limbo conversations, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, might be the name of the future. Yeah. Rebranding. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, uh, some some um, groups of people uh, nationwide for for different countries or even subgroups of some some nations they they seem to have uh, different dynamics in in lockdown. Some people are locked. Some people are not that locked down. Some people are facing the. <laughs> world right now some people are facing a second one now coming so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, i think the world began well, not simultaneously because everything uh, exploded out of china probably. yes and, and then covered the, the world but there was a um, some some kind of simultaneity to to everything yeah and and right now this is getting desynchronized yeah so, different regions, different parts, of, different people experience different dynamics of, of this worldly uh, way of, of tackling the, the problem with the virus. If, if there's Absolutely. A... Yeah, it's very um, local, isn't it? Very differentiated. Well, it's strange. There's a global phenomenon, but the local conditions are what really prevail, what, what really tells your story in your place at your time. It seems like that's maybe one of the big... Uh, ponder points of the whole thing really that how how can the same thing be so different in so many places simultaneously across <laughs> unfolding time yeah yeah really fascinating mm -hmm. so we, we were chatting a bit and and talking by um uh, messenger beforehand yesterday and things and you mentioned i think from the bulgarian end of things possibly a second lockdown is that is that right well it's um, somehow, uh, this is mixed with, uh, with a situation that unfolded in the past uh, week, probably. Yeah. Uh, there's been peaceful riots, if, if there's such a thing, <laughs> yeah. around. So every day, more and more people want to take the government down. Yeah. Um, for, for the people listening to that, uh, Bulgaria is not a country where we eat dogs. Yeah. Well, <laughs> some people say that. Yes. You're telling that's me that the, that's saying. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that's not the case. A very civilized, but um, somehow disorganized. So there's a lot of corruption. Um, but corruption leads to many other things, of course, and then leads to poverty of, of the people, no democracy, no proper democracy. And uh, this reached a critical mass just recently. The prime minister and the president were fighting in, in the media, non-directly, of course. Yeah. There were scams around that. So, so people got fed up with that. Yes. And right now, the, the situation with the second lockdown, as the news reported that, that there could be a second wave, there might be a, uh, a second lockdown on the way. This is not decided yet, but this uh -huh. might be the, the, the crucial point where we'll protect ourselves from the second yeah. death toll yeah. to come. And on top of that, rioting came as a fact for many people. More and more people are doing that. Yes. So right now, no one really knows. <laughs> where to focus yeah. on yeah. distancing on collective effort towards yes. something uh, on what really so when no one knows if, if there will be a non-governmental leadership of, of the of the people uh -huh. proper democracy through yeah. uh, some kind of Che Guevara movement yes. towards the, <laughs> the Prime Minister or we'll have a, a second lockdown so it's a kind of a limbo between political and I see what some kind mean. of social medical. Really interesting, because those tensions seem to run through every society at this point in, in different combinations. And like we were saying, differentiated and taking different forms in different places. But the, the bigger 
almost archetypal themes behind them of top-down authoritarian imposed control for better or for worse or ground root upswelling outbursts of you know rage or um, dissatisfaction or revolutionary intent all of these things are in play in different combinations and somewhere in the heart of it all just what you said that nobody knows where to focus their attention and their awareness and how to make sense of what they perceive right in front of them uh, mm -hmm. and that this has been going on now long enough to not be new to 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 be something that yeah. one has to yeah i mean it shows up in in the therapy room certainly i mean just just today Definitely. Um, yeah people who have been vulnerable and, and in the uk they talk a lot about shielding people who've been shielding from contact with others more, more than everybody else you know for specific reasons of mainly health compromise and underlying liabilities and uh yeah i was talking to someone this morning who has three kids um, adult children he lives alone and uh he's been shielding for 13 14 weeks <clears throat> in a very clear way so hasn't left his house hasn't seen anyone and uh started just to start meeting his kids one at a mm -hmm. time coming into his garden and that kind of thing and it's all going very well <laughs> and then one of his sons just walks into his house and starts wandering into different rooms and picking things up and going oh what's this and what's that like in his own mind having declared the whole thing over and and that whatever that is that that's around strongly I keep noticing the polarizing effect of that with different people I'm working with. That for some, it's never been more real, and for others, it's like yesterday's news. And I, oh, that's that's like so kind of June, twenty twenty. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. <laughs> and, and it does go with, uh, I suppose, if we think on a European scale at least, um, the opening up of travel possibilities again in some way. Um, which seems again very mixed very differentiated but I did read a newspaper article that you know horrified me and made me chuckle in equal measure really and it was about British tourists I think probably young men was the inference uh, in Magaluf in Mallorca which is a mm -hmm. place with a terrible reputation among British tourists as uh, a, a destination for getting horribly drunk and misbehaving yeah. And, and that was happening. They'd been arrested for jumping on cars and running around on the roofs of vehicles and you know, just behaving in that drunken, debauched, mad way. And, and the bit that made me laugh was, oh, well, that's just that's that's a sign of normality. <laughs> that's, that's what British tourists do when they're in Magaluf versus, my God, you know, this is horrifying. And, and yeah, clearly they weren't social distancing. <laughs> well, be it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the, 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 I'm, I'm always, um, well, I have several colleagues here with whom I work and then share some thoughts and, and, and some ideas. Uh, but oftentimes one of the, one of the cold, one-sided and very rigid ideas ab about why different people do common things. Yeah. Uh, is oftentimes associated with, with what, been, what we've been discussing here that uh, this is always reduced to parents, this is always reduced to early personal history, and that's reinforced by neuroscience, and, and that's fine. I, I, I don't mind that. Yeah. But then comes the anthropological and cultural and spiritual and many other things that just leave this idea to pieces. Just because I, I'm a son of my parents, I want to go to Italy, for example, and I will probably behave very quietly, and I will look at uh, the Uffizi Gallery in a very humble, very con contained, very restrained manner. Yes, but, but that won't be because my parents are very religious people that taught me to be quiet all, all yes. my life, or, or whatever the reason. Yes. There's a cultural, spiritual context to that, that even if I'm one of the, <laughs> let's say, most deviant people in my group, age, or, or, or gender, yes. group and 
I go to the UVC. I, I don't believe I will I will smash the place to pieces. Yes. And there's some instances around that very flamboyant yeah. characteristically speaking people going to some kind of a very culturally and spiritually embedded place and that seems to bring them down to calm them to 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 yeah. restructure reorganize them on, on many different layers and levels yeah. and what you're mentioning might be well, not really the other way around but some kind of dynamic you know switching places yeah. what kind of person goes to what kind of place and how yes. the dynamic between the place and the person plays out yeah of course, yeah. we can say that parents might might be a factor somewhere there. Of course, I'm not neglecting sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. No, I, th I think that's really interesting, and it reminds me of um, it, you know bringing. Let's just talk in old-fashioned terms. Bringing certain uh, like glimpses through a hole in the fence, like you've got a wooden fence and there's a tiny little mm -hmm. knot hole, and you can spy through it. Those kind of moments um, are. Uh, let's say high culture so you know great art great literature great music bringing them into situations that are where they wouldn't generally be uh, have the time or the um, the conditions to thrive so i'm thinking of bringing them into when i've worked in prisons and things like that and and yeah that's always a very interesting and revealing situation to see how on the one hand people inmates in prison men in prison in my experience who generally speaking demographically speaking tend not to have much of an education if any and you know have all kinds of kind of factors at work um, from nature from nurture and so on um, and yet clearly not for everyone but in the right moment in the right setting an encounter with Beethoven or an encounter with Shakespeare or I don't know it could be anything just the right thing at the right moment that's the the, the contents of the Uffizi entering a different institution mm -hmm. you might say um, because those themes speak of something that is trans-temporal and and do it in a way that isn't shying from the vertical <laughs> axis um, I, I don't necessarily mean universal that that would have been how I'd have talked about it in the past. That there's you know great art has a universal quality to it, and in a shorthand way of saying it, that's sort of true. But it's more how how does one have the humility to not know how to behave in the presence of something that is clearly bigger than me? Yeah, and uh, that seems to exist in human beings. By and large, unless it's been, you know, layered over or um, wounded deeply to a point that it struggles to, to come out again. But, but for most people, there's a layer of intactness about that when they're not drunk. <laughs> so back to the drunken mm -hmm. British tourist, that, that's a shortcut route to that not being able to happen for sure. You're in a different world at that point. <laughs> Something that you mentioned, and, and I've always been fascinated by that. that probably, before, we've probably talked about that before. Many fascinating stories that you told me about about that experience in uh, working in prisons. Yes. And um, while you were talking, I was thinking about that. Um, what is a prison? Yeah. <laughs> Actually. Yeah. 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 Uh, and that might seem like a very new age Facebook posted question <laughs> for people to like or to clickbait or whatever. But I'm, I'm really wondering what is it specifically? I'm not really entirely buying Michel Foucault on uh, what was it called? I think it's uh, Discipline and Punish, yeah. the birth of, of the prisons, yeah. something along the lines of that. He has very clear insights, but there's a strong intellectual yeah. rumination through the theme of prisons. And I greatly admire that work, but I think there's a whole lot more than, than yes. that addition. So what sense do you make of? Yeah, well, I, <laughs> to, give, to give a really, what, what it did for me was 
the question was bring bring a memory. I'm sure I've told you about this before, so apologies for repeating, going over yeah. old ground. But my first job as a as a very newly qualified therapist was in a uh, prison. Um, so I was working in a prison, and then I got another job alongside it a few months later, working in a university. So this was Cardiff Prison in the capital in Wales, and Cardiff University, which are physically not that far apart um, in the old centre of the city. And um, so, yeah, it used to be that I'd work two and a half days in each place. So there was one day, which was usually a Wednesday, where I would be in the morning in the prison, and then after lunchtime, I'd be in the university. And I mean, it sounds mad, but my experience was, and my notes from the time, if I looked at them, would, would have it there, that you couldn't really distinguish one from the other at the level of the mind and the uh, the kind of intuitive sense. So um, clearly at, at the material level, they're quite different, although they're both institutions. And on one level, it's simply a matter of budget and which one has the nicer rooms, which one has bars on the windows. But beyond those simple observational things, they were very, very, very similar. And, and the work was very similar. And um, I always remember talking about, um, so for me, this was tied up with kind of road testing psychosynthesis to see, because even having spent years studying it and practicing it and being in therapy for it, I still hadn't convinced all of myself that it was a robust enough form or vehicle in the world. And so working in a prison and trying to apply psychosynthesis practice and, and, and working methods that was the test you know does it can it work here was the question and if it can okay i can i can rely upon it it's it's trustworthy and that's kind of what happened but i realized that the work took so, so thinking in particular of subpersonality work so i was doing a lot of work with people in prison with subpersonality work and in groups as well with myths and stories and big themes and then in the university much more one-to-one -one work with people and we'd been looking at subpersonalities and, and the work with these two individuals, one a prison inmate and one a postgrad student, PhD student in the university. Um, and I think the guy, if I remember rightly, in the prison was originally from somewhere in the Caribbean and convicted for various drug crimes. And there he was. And the guy in the university was from Mexico, I remember very clearly. And we were working on this idea of subpersonalities and trying to name and populate their own sense of who, the dramatis personae, you might say, who, who, who shows up, who's here. And on this particular Wednesday, I had the meeting with the guy in the prison in the morning and he'd come up with this list that he'd written of his subpersonalities or the, the initial, you know, most vivid, most noticeable ones, maybe half a dozen of them. And he'd given them all names, um, because obviously, as you know very well, naming subpersonalities is a very powerful thing. And it has to ideally come from the, the person whose subpersonalities they are, not to be imposed. You know, it wouldn't have been much help me naming them for him. It's much more useful for him to name them himself. And he'd named them all after characters from soap operas, because that's what he spent a lot of time watching whilst in prison so they were you know his depressed subpersonality was named after a character in eastenders uh, for anyone who's ever seen eastenders it was doc cotton this kind of famously curmudgeonly grumpy depressed browbeaten woman and then in the afternoon exactly the same exercise but with this guy who is you know about to do his viva for his phd and he's been writing this thesis about um I forget the details, but it was basically about world literature and, and certain aspects within that. And of course, all of his subpersonalities were named after great figures from world literature. So he had his Don Quixote subpersonality uh, and so on, you know. Um, and but the, the, the mechanism was identical. They both done exactly the same thing within the frame of reference that pertained to their hole in the fence view of culture or of the culture world and the way it impacted the psyche for them and yeah i've never forgotten that it was a real real eye opener a real kind of leveler and um and actually the work was equally you know in inverted commas successful 
in both cases. It, it wasn't a function of I have freedom and liberty and I don't. It was much more an internal shift. There's a book I remember reading at the time, can't remember the name of the author right now, I'd have to look it up, put it in the links, but the book is called We're All Doing Time. Um, mm -hmm. And it's sort of literally about spirituality in prisons, but a book for everyone, because as the title suggests, the big understanding is, you, you know, you may find there are times where you're actually physically in a prison, but a lot of the time you're in a prison of your own, well, Kierkegaard or something, the old kind of language, or Wittgenstein, it's the kind of language prison, the prison of concept, the prison of how we are able to conceive of reality and filter our senses or not. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what it pushed my mind to. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was contemplating this idea of uh, how everything can be considered prison. Yeah. Which... <laughs> if anything can be considered to be everything else, does that mean that the opposite might be considered everything else? Sometimes it works yes. in some kind of a, we've all seen the naive to positive psychosynthesis and transpersonal paradigms, how they work. Everything is love, everything op operates on, on the plane of existence because, because that's, that's a fact. But that's a one-sided thing. I was, I was just thinking that uh, if everything is or can be considered a prison, yes. can everything else be considered freedom? Yes. I'm not entirely sure, really. Uh, just because uh, this uh, concoction meat, bones, <laughs> fluids, and everything else, and then hair and everything. Yes. That, this is a prison by itself. Yes. But th this might be a, a prison for people that really want to transcend that. I want to jump five meters in the air yeah. and run perfectly on my feet. Yeah. Fine, do it. <laughs> and, and people never stop doing that, but in a very civilized manner, which is called sport these days. And, and you have a pole <laughs> that you push yeah. yourself yeah. with. So the, the desire to transcend yeah. Uh, probably a freedom in itself, but you need the right tools to do it. Yeah. And sometimes we hate the tools, <laughs> yeah. not our own prison. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's all sorts of things that come to mind there from, I suppose it's the, the one of the key things in Viktor Frankl, isn't it? That the thing that liberates from the prison experience is one's own inner connection to that core um, cannot be taken away from the understanding of myself as a being um, yeah. yeah which which clearly has that spiritual resonance but isn't anything but a sort of flaky new age transcendent you know spiritual avoidance or uh, bypassing kind of thing it's, it's absolutely real that everything can be taken from me up to and including the ongoing nature of my existence and my life but it's about the manner of the way I approach that. That's that's what underwrites <laughs> my my being. I actually had a thought about that the other day. I was watching um, a <laughs> strange kind of thing. I found myself drawn to watching a documentary, three part documentary, I think it was, made in the nineties about the English Civil War, as so called. I mean, arguably that's not a good name for it because it's it, it's certainly a British Civil War. It involves all all four nations. But anyway, whatever we call it, and, and, and it culminating in Parliament uh, prevailing on the battlefield after several goes and finally coming to regicide, to beheading the king. So, so kind of traditionally understood as the breaking of the sovereign's power in the British constitution and the, the primacy of a parliamentary ultimately parliamentary democracy but at that point sort of parliamentary gentry kind of rule and the the, the, the sovereign as a kind of symbolic figurehead come uh, point at which you can um, yeah focus the national interest you might say and uh, yeah I mean this is not uncommon in historical terms but it, it was really interesting 
to be reminded of it that the the way a in this case a sovereign a king dies on the executioner's block becomes really significant so partly breeding partly god's regent on earth the anointed one partly all of that but also a certain kind of personal courage that one faces the axe with you know dignity and courage and fortitude and there's a famous story about charles the first going to be executed and it was a january morning i believe frosty cold london you know you can imagine not great weather for such a thing big crowd and uh, he was afraid that his shivering from the cold would be misunderstood by the crowd as fear. So his famous last request was that he might be allowed to wear more shirts to keep him warm so that he could not shiver and therefore you know, deliver his speech and give his head um, without being misread in that way. And yeah, I don't know, there's something that speaks to the psyche in that. He's not the first, I'm sure he won't be the last to have faced that moment in such a way. But yeah, you find something out about yourself, I imagine, in a moment like that. Whether mm -hmm. you're Charles the First or Joan of Arc or Jesus Christ or you know, who who whosoever goes to that moment of um, ah, this is it then. There's no there's no cavalry coming to my rescue here. This is me meeting my maker. How then yeah. shall I how shall the manner of my leaving <laughs> look what, what shall i um what, what's the inheritance of this and how will it speak to others in the future it's that kind of thing yeah not bravado not not it's no place for kind of a punchline is it there's something else that's it, 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 it's not a deathbed confession it's a, <laughs> a public act of something yeah this reminds me of uh braveheart the Mel Gibson movie, legendary movie, of course, but yeah, depicting William Wallace. But I'm, I was always fascinated if, if that's overly depicting his traits as very courageous, or was he that courageous, or was mm -hmm. he less? Mm -hmm. But then there's many questions about that. But uh, I can remember the, the last scene where they caught him and, and they uh, dismantled his body yes. and his uh, hands to the up yeah. two sides of the wall on it. And there was a, a kind of a revelation. Yeah. This might be the, the filmmaker's idea, uh -huh. but it, it's really important that the filmmaker thought or fantasized that William Wallace himself fantasized or thought or had this kind of a hallucination. Yes. Slash revelation, <laughs> putting those two together because of the movie. But then he saw his deceased wife, he saw um, mm. everything slowing down, everything was suddenly understandable, mm. just knowing that he's going to die in any of the few left minutes of, of the movie, really. Yes. So, so uh, there's something about that. The supreme disidentification, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I am not my body even though I am still attached to the form of my body as it's undergoing these kind of outrages and tortures. Yeah, exquisite sufferings, yeah. I, I read something the other day, two things that just connected to that immediately as a reaction. One yes. was, I'm still researching my newly found interest for Gio de Luz, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it's more giving me a headache than anything else. <laughs> Some bits and pieces here and then I, I'm trying to connect that to psychosynthesis theory just to see. And uh, interestingly enough, there's no difference about the levels of that understanding. And uh, Deleuze himself uses a very uh, weird indie horror film term that goes uh, body without organs. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, he, uh, I think the term is provocative mm -hmm. on purpose mm -hmm. to make us think, but uh, he refers to that as the ground zero of everything. <laughs> so, the body so, without uh, organs. Yeah, any system might be considered a body, so we have an emotional body, corporal body, we have an intellectual body, spiritual body, yeah. many, many 
the psychosynthesis of things and anyway uh, psychoanalysis also comes into the, the containing body the motherly gaze the parental yes. gaze that contains the, the child or the, the person that's across yes but the news has, says that the body without organs has several uh, manifestations. One is the empty, one is the full, and one is the cancer. And he says that the, the full body without organs is the healthy one. Yeah. Uh, and this can be found in, in people that are free. Yes. He never defines what that means, <laughs> but contrasts that that uh, purely schizophrenic people have an empty body without organs. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The whole machinery, the whole machinery of the psyche, the whole machinery of the yes. belief system of body works on the very primal level of ground zero. Yes. Even depicts that with uh, a person that can cannot speak but can move in the direction of primal sounds, just sound making, and calls it uh, a body that works on the level of inspiration respiration evaporation and and liquid transmission it's but that, <laughs> yeah, that's not applicable to the the real world because this uh, body doesn't have the ability to reproduce itself uh, and so on yeah so i believe this supreme uh sub personality detachment let's say yeah. use the stronger word about that yeah it come to terms with with your own body without organs yeah. but at this moment everything works, works together this is how i imagine it mm. every single system machinery every single thing that's needed for you to be fully present in, in those last few seconds yes. is probably tied very closely to one another yes. and at the same time being one with everything, but being absolutely differentiated from anything. Yes. Is that what I imagine? Yeah. It makes me think of um, very specific constructions of, of how, might, how you might experience or inhabit a certain space and time. So <laughs> that's an extreme one, isn't it? If you're about to, as it were, be executed, publicly mm -hmm. especially, and there you are. You're, you're inhabiting something that has a very finite, the, the, the pocket of your universe is collapsing around you and shrinking down. And yeah, the manner of how you inhabit it is, is really important. And no one knows what the etiquette of that really is, I guess. I mean, I suppose at a time where there were many more executions, there was an etiquette for it, but you, until you're in it, you know, it's, how's this going to go? And another one, a recent example, quite quite different in some ways, but I, I think you'll see why I'm making a connection between them. So I was talking to a, a client of mine last week who's a doctor, and she was describing to me how strange it is, um, well, partly how strange it is to have to go about your hospital routines um, fully kitted up in, in the sort of PPE protective gear but but specifically because this had just happened uh, the night before so i was speaking to her in the morning and the night before she'd been on a shift and there was a, a patient on a ward in this hospital who had a cardiac arrest and the, the the crash response happens so the beepers go off and anyone nearby who's got the right training rushes to that place so you assemble a team out of whoever's there to you know make the intervention as rapidly as possible so this was happening and she said so imagine you know we're on we're in a ward um, with other patients so you have to sort of screen the bed off so it's private enough and then there are like five six medics in full ppe taking the different roles to work on this person who very unexpectedly had gone into cardiac arrest um, in their full ppe so it's quite extraordinary, you know, the stuff of um, TV drama, but but real. And, you know, there's various bits of high tech kit. There's the, I never remember what they're called, the, the kind of paddles that they use to try and restart the heart. And mm. anyway, they do this and they have protocols for how to do this under current um, coronavirus kind of conditions. Uh, so they do it. 
I think for all of them, this was the first time they'd done it under these new protocols. And so one of the problems that's identified is that the chest compression work, um, because of its nature, is an aerosol transmission risk because you're pushing and <sighs> the breath is rushing out from the lungs. And so after, um, in this instance, the patient died, the, the cardiac arrest, you know, was fatal. Uh, and at a certain point, the decision was taken. I think whoever's leading the team has to say, in my judgment, this patient isn't going to make it. Does anyone disagree? Or shall we stop here? Because we're, we're achieving nothing and we're possibly, you know, making things worse. And, and the agreement was unanimous. Okay, we stop. And she said it was really, really weird because suddenly the, the protocols say because of the CPR has happened, because there's a transmission and aerosol risk, everyone must just stay where they are in their kit for 20 minutes. Um, so this, this was completely new, completely alien. And although they all knew it theoretically, no one had yet done it. And suddenly they're all in it doing it. And she said it was just the weirdest silence that descended um, because all the machines are switched off the intensity and drama and adrenaline of the intervention is over. The patient is lying there in the bed dead, newly dead, newly deceased. And the five, six doctors are cramped, stood behind a curtain, knowing that the other side of the curtain, there are all these other patients who've heard it all, but seen nothing, who maybe are confused or distressed or, you know, have questions, all of this. And, she said it was just the weirdest thing. She said, I, I genuinely didn't know how to feel. I didn't know what I should be feeling. Should I feel sad? Should I feel upset? Should I feel, well, um, you know, we should talk to each other and debrief. Should we, you know, have something we do because we're stood with this newly deceased body? You know, just no answers to any of these questions and no real mapping even of what the questions would be that arise in that space. It was a really, really interesting thing to hear about and completely unprecedented and challenging. But yeah, it's it, another one of those weird, brief, arising pockets of an encounter with something that could quickly, I'm sure, become routine if, if you're working in that setting. But the very first time, it's a different experience and there's a newness about it that is no pun intended i was going to say is arresting that stops you in your tracks and makes you be faced by wow what is this who are we what are we doing what does any of it mean the whole existential rigor comes home so yeah just that, that comes mm. to mind yep reminded me of all sorts of, of uh, some kind of very vivid imagery uh, very vivid memories of or pictures mainly yes of egyptian funerals ah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah you know early catholic or orthodox christianity funerals yes uh, a person being there lying there either newly deceased or ultimately you might say old days and there's a ritual to be done. Mm, 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 mm. But I was just uh, getting my mental slide uh, in, in terms of timing. I tried to think of the, can you imagine the first time yeah. a culturally and spiritually connected people had to deal with a deceased one? I think it's the same thing. What should we do now? And probably after many attempts of, of, of really trying to dig through that mud of, yes. of overwhelming feelings and, and, and everything, yes. someone said, do you want to take his liver out or hers? And th there has to be someone that said yes. <laughs> yeah. If everyone else said no, that, that they wouldn't do it probably, yeah. or they would have killed the one proposing that. Yeah. So many attempts towards that, and I think this is how these rituals might have been born in the past. Mm. Well, and that's that, that's significant in all sorts of ways too, isn't it? Just the way that the archaeological and 
paleoarchaeological record has to place such huge value on um, they usually talk about funerary rites and burial rites and they identify whole, whole <coughs> groups of people by the way they appear to have practice have certain practices around the deceased um, that that's a kind of marker of uh, divisions or differentiations between these people and those people well these people cremate their dead these people buried their dead in this way or in that way or in this orientation or always east west or you know whatever it might be um, yeah really fascinating <laughs> oh. i think uh, i probably remember the culture that that had this tradition but um, i think some arabic people did it in the past and, and they're still doing it so some some kind of smaller tribe like connection people like yes uh, when someone's disease they they roll him up in a hundred meter plain white cotton sheet rolling mm. him and then the, the the grave itself it's freshly dug they roll the person towards the top that's rolling more and, more, and then fall um, on the same note, <laughs> and this might sound humoristically accurate, but how on earth did they came up with that idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There's something wrong with that, <laughs> probably. Yes. Spinning itself, being in a kind of vertical position, that's yeah. part of many cultures. Yeah. Still, to this day, and even historically. So there might be something around that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that archaeology digs some stuff out of, of the earth and interprets them. But I've never heard an archaeologist, probably except Jung. Yeah. Can you, can you imagine how those people felt yeah. back then? Yeah. Well, uh, it, 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 yeah, and, and and it's fascinating then to think of the where it exists, the inter, interplay, let's call it that, between when there is something of a historical record and then there's archaeological practice. And the it's often in, in uh, the way that's gone, a, a, a decision, a choice to be made. Do we believe this one or do we believe that one? <laughs> do we lean this way or do we lean that, lean that way? And it just suddenly made me remember, I can't remember the detail of it, but there's um, there's a couple of passages I'm sure there's a lot more than that, actually. But I'm thinking of a couple of passages in um, Herodotus, mm -hmm. the father of history on the one hand, or the father of lies, if you take that view. <laughs> but he he writes somewhere about, he's writing about the Persians. So the whole thing, the whole book is about, uh, the histories is about the the Greeks and the Persians and his understanding of their conflict and how it came to be, although it's a hugely uh, diffuse and diverse meander. So it, it takes an awfully long time to get to talking specifically about the Greco-Persian kind of wars and conflicts, but he, he clearly admires the Persians enormously. And, and, and at one point he's talking about how do, basically how do you, how do you administer and run an empire that big is kind of what he's riffing on in his mind and he's talked to lots of sources and he's got this kind of idea which is probably somewhat accurate somewhat erroneous of the extent of the persian empire so he knows the the eastern end of it uh, sorry he knows the western end of it the greek end of it but he doesn't really know far 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 towards india and, and even maybe beyond but he gives this example or and it's to do with burial rights or, or the rights around the, the deceased and he talks about these people i forget who the one group of people are they may be um somewhere in the kind of modern turkey kind of region but these people are petitioning the emperor who I think is is maybe Cyrus or one of the Xerxes is as, asking you know for permission not to um, unify burial codes across the whole empire, but to be allowed to keep doing what they do, 
So, so they're asking, can we continue to bury our dead within like 24 hours or whatever it might have been? Don't remember exactly that one. And contrasted with it, there's another party that has come to the same court to lobby the same ruler at the same time on the same point about being allowed to maintain their burial practices. And they've come from somewhere in India, and he names them, I think, and their practices, when somebody dies, we eat them. And each party is utterly horrified by the other party. It's like, how, how can you eat your recently deceased relative? You know, that's, that's beyond, that's appalling. And they're looking back and going, how could you bury them in the ground? That's just unthinkable and awful. And, and there's the monarch in the center of it all having to make this judgment call. And of course, I mean, apocryphally or otherwise, he says, I have a solution to this you people that do the burying you now have to eat your recently deceased and you people over here that eat your deceased you now have to bury your deceased <laughs> so he's imposing each other's practices on them with utter horror and then of course yeah suggests what he was planning all along which is some sort of if you follow the party line you can have localized freedoms but the the power at the center is is uh, is always going to prevail, <laughs> or else I'll impose these people's practices upon you, and you won't uh, you won't be able to stomach that. <laughs> Herodotus is full of things like that. Fantastic. Yeah. There's um. Uh, I don't know if you've heard this story. That there's there's a bit in there where he talks about um, mythic creatures and how travelers have seen evidence and skeletons of these mythic creatures and dragons really, or some kind of griffins or something of this nature. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, in more sort of, it, within historic time, this has been laughed at as, as, and given as evidence that Herodotus is making it all up and he's just a fantasist. You know, he's listening to kind of tall tales from travelers and taking it to be real and it's just ridiculous and we shouldn't really take anything in Herodotus at face value. It's at best a kind of pseudo history or just a ripping yarn, you know, just a story. And then somebody more recently um, did, did the forensic bit on this and discovered that the basically the Silk Road, that, that one part of this passes through this Mongolian uh, desert area with cliffs in which there are eroding out of the cliff uh, triceratops skulls with with big horns and yeah it's just fantastic that you know it could very literally have been this very scene that's still there to be witnessed today um, that's being described but how else are you going to interpret uh, great big creaturely skulls with big horns coming out of them other than as yeah mythic beasts kind of an accurate way of describing it just like uh, i think in the alps mammoth bones that were given christian burial you know in in the medieval period if, if a, mam a mammoth skeleton started to appear out of a glacier or something like a thigh bone here and a bit of a uh, foot bone there they, they believed them to be uh, a race of giants that preceded mm -hmm. the humans as we have them now and and so you know, well, these were people that never had the Christian message, but they're still God's creatures, so we should give them a Christian burial. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, um, I think that, well, might be culturally, might be contextually, uh, might be personally, might be spiritually embedded, or developing that uh, how we bury how we treat the disease is temporal yeah but it's probably forever somehow that this specific person dies this this exact time forever. Yeah. if we consider reincarnation it's not the same person that's going to be reincarnated if we don't consider reincarnation, this person dies and transcends to a different place. Yeah. If we go with the atheisms, ju you just switch off and yeah. that's it. But anyways, th there's a, a permanent thing to that death it, itself and, and this yeah. tra transmission. But then, then there's the 
temporary way of how you will be buried, how you will be given your last farewell, how you will be uh, treated even, yeah. with whom, where, how, yeah. under what circumstances, with what belief, on, on what end, with yes. what feet emerging from the other people around them, yeah. on your body. Yeah. And, uh, but I'm really curious what uh, burial rites will look in the future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the uh, 80s and, and 19 sci-fi movies with a shuttle that you are blasted in the space. Yeah. And you just blow for eternity almost. Yeah. With the US flag here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> And this is this is really because these things change so many times. There are some cultures that preserve them, and then that's that's enriching the cultural yeah. pool that we live in. But what will happen in the future? Uh, there are some some uh, contemporary modern practices of, of burial that uh, they get your body to an incinerator and yes. then. Uh, your ashes are put in, in, in some kind of a tube that has seeds for a particular kind of tree. Uh -huh. and then the graveyard is uh, measured for these trees to grow. That very big. I'm, I'm, I'm sequoia is not really, but something yeah. resembling that. Yeah. Very fast growing and very tall. Yeah. Uh, and in 100 years time from now, all the people buried as trees will become a forest. Yeah. Yeah. This is some, something of the newer forms of burial that, that people in the Yeah, well, I, I mean, it, there's this kind of um, as in life, so in death aspect to this, isn't there? It's like that's possible if you can afford it. If, if you're willing to pay or someone's willing to pay, it, it's, uh, I, I remember as a child being stunned and, and writing a poem about it, one of the first kind of juvenilia proper poems I ever wrote about how I'd been to the funeral of um, the next door neighbours of my parents in the house I lived in and grew up in and the the, uh, the man had died it was the first time I you know known someone who had then died and went to the funeral and it was in a uh, crematorium so it was that kind of industrial process really of, of dying and that's how i viewed it as a whatever i was 12 i think it was like going to a factory and, and i was amazed that there was a queue that there was another funeral waiting behind us to go in and we had to wait for the one that was already in and it's like a production line and yeah that became the poem that even death is a sort of production line time is the the kind of ruling thing you've got half an hour for your service and then you've got to be off and it was really confusing. What does any of this mean? And yeah. yeah, what I didn't appreciate then was that that was costing someone thousands of pounds, <laughs> even for that version. Um, and, and that certainly in North America, it's, it's big business, like everything, you know, you, you go and you choose from a hundred different caskets and you can have your video tombstone that will give a video address to your, uh, antecedents <laughs> and so forth it's it's just bizarre isn't it it's really really strange mm -hmm. and then you think of and this has happened in i think every country uh, yeah, some it's more obvious more open than others but during the ongoing uh where we began really the pandemic um mass burials pet burial pits uh, the kind of burying en masse which is something you don't associate with high tech you know we can turn you into a diamond for somebody to wear on their finger and inherit in the future it's like no 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 we just throw you all in a pit with a jcb and then cover you over <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 extraordinary stuff and, and deeply telling i think there's um well, the three, if I count it correctly, the three instances of that is if if people are allowed to bury close ones yes. uh, on their own terms, however they decide to do it. Yeah. The second one is how do you, um, how do you industrialize that? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to make it easier and to be able to sell that properly. Yeah. And the third one is when when people, but the, the, at least this sounded, um, this voice sounded like that in my mind that if if people are not given the, the proper time, the proper space to bury someone, yeah. if the if the machinery that calculates yes is overwhelmed, you just throw bodies in a pit. Yeah, there's nothing else to do. Yes. Yes. You try to manage that, as we've seen with the pandemic, with the doctors in Italy and in, in the US. If you try to manage that, to bury each and every person, you will die probably from exhaustion, from stress, from anything. Yeah. So th this might be a bit of will 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 path. It's um, yeah. sorry that we are grasping a little bit, but yeah. I think that if you don't own death, if you don't give death. It's, it's proper space and time and yes. context, it becomes contagious. Yes. It will take it from you. Yes. You're not burying that person. <laughs> if I can use the voice of death, which is a little bit scary to this moment. <laughs> Don't bury this person properly. I will make sure that I will take it from you personally. Yes. Kind of expansion around that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And the... Um just thinking then of a sort of photograph with very little commentary around it, just a photograph taken in, I think it was taken in 1920. And it was uh, of one of the big um, First World War battlefields on the Western Front. And the completely lost bit of history, certainly to my awareness, it, just loads of people who had previously been in, in the armies fighting in that area now being employed two years after or 18 months after the end of hostilities to try and recover body parts from these sort of shell blasted kind of uh, landscapes and sometimes finding something they could identify a, a wedding ring or maybe a, a tag with the name on that kind of thing going to that trouble um, to oh, I think the other part of the work was to try and um, they, they call it the iron harvest trying to remove the munitions that were still there that were still obviously dangerous and actually to this very day they're still every year finding when they plow the fields in that part of Belgium or France they 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 always find a certain number of unexploded munitions be they hand grenades or bigger caliber kind of shells and things but back then this would have been you know infinitely more <laughs> uh an extraordinary just this intense photograph i saw it glimpsed at it black and white photograph and, and immediately took it to be a war scene because it looked it was that landscape recognizably and then i thought hang on that guy is sat on the edge the parapet of the trench he he, he couldn't do that in a war he'd have been shot what's going on and then i looked closely and yeah, it was parties with shovels digging excavating claiming back and this is where most of the uh, war cemeteries, war graves that, that are now visible all along that, that uh, well, the Western Front in particular, um, that's where the bodies came from, from being exhumed from wherever they'd fallen and the ones that had died in medical clearing stations and things that were known about and documented. Really extraordinary, really, that there's something about the, the need to put the archaeology, the physical remains, with the history, the specific story of this person or that person, wherever it's possible to do so, that just mm. seems to be an instinct in, I guess I would associate almost in Freudian terms with, with civilization. It's, it's a civilized thing to do, whether it's for your own people, whether it's for the apparent enemy, it's the same yeah, this goes with that. I just think that's really important. Mm -hmm. mm. That's something along that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I also just another stray thought that a lot of these really early, they're often spoken of as cities now, that the kind of, what would they have been, early Bronze Age kind of settlements in like Chattelhayek and places and probably others by now, 
where you often find burials under the living room floor, as it were. So we're burying the family members of the previous generation or two underneath the place where we now live and eat and go about our lives. And then at some point that stops and it becomes a separate thing to put the dead over there, as if some practice has really fundamentally changed. Uh, and one would imagine some kind of trace is left on the, the collective psyche. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure if that's entirely true, but uh, there's some kind of truthfulness to that. I, I believe yes. that no matter how bizarre the, the burial or practice or the, the death rite of passage or whatever related to that, no matter how bizarre it is, yes. mention it to someone they might react with, oh, that's gross. We don't do that. But that just reaches the cultural and the emotional level. But on the very intuitive spiritual level, there seems to be no conflict. Yes. These people bury the, their disease this way. And you might say, with, what? But then underneath all that seems to be a, a very, very, very peaceful reaction yeah. of, yes, yeah. they do it. And, and that's how we human beings do it. Yeah, yeah. Because There's a rightness of, about it. Yeah. 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 Mm. Mm. Well, but I'm not sure if, if Will does any uh, talks like those, but we can probably decide to invite him. Yeah. Him. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Very good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's lots of thoughts going in many directions from that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and something about the initial encounter with a practice that feels alien. And then over time, maybe, as you said, maybe quite quickly, uh, a space for it. A sort of, ah, yeah, okay. Mm. I mean, people tell stories of, and, and in, certainly in a lot of the Indian traditions, um, yeah, of the, the great cemeteries. The, 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 there's the, the eight great cemeteries often depicted in kind of mandala form, and that these are terrifying places, but places of enormous spiritual power. That's the understanding mm -hmm. that, yeah, they're, they're kind of haunted, but they're also inhabited by tigers and <laughs> God knows what else, snakes. Reasons, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that actually this is where uh, tremendous potency exists between a thin place again, between life, death, the, the orders of uh, consciousness, that there's a great sort of sequence, a, a trilogy of books um, written by Robert Svoboda, who's a, an American Ayurveda scholar, among other things, and teacher, um, about his teacher. Um, Sri Vimalananda and yeah his the first of the trilogy there talks about I think it's the left hand of God or Agora the left hand of God is um, yeah his entire practice given to him is to go to a cemetery find a fresh corpse sit on it as if it were your prayer mat and practice yoga mat really use use a human corpse as a yoga mat do your practice and don't move be unshakable you know you you will be challenged beyond belief for the temerity to do this thing but if you're strong enough yeah and he he his patron deity becomes uh i think uh, smashan tara so it's a form of the goddess tara that is associated with uh smashan is cemetery or, or a bone ground charnel house that kind of thing so she appears in this devastating terrifying way but he starts to see her as a loving mother come to breastfeed him. And it's, it's all there. <laughs> it's all there. It's shocking, appalling on some level, but also it becomes this ecstatic outbreak of um, unconditional, truly unconditional love and um, sublime kind of compassion for, for everybody because that's that's where we're all going <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> yeah
<laughs> well, that's not bad for a Tuesday lunchtime. We've done all right there, that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> when people watch that, that, it might be a different thing, but for everyone watching, just bear in mind this is 3.15 my time and 1.15 kids' time <laughs> to have a talk like that, <laughs> to have a sense of, uh, of the context around, around it. <laughs> Yes, it's going to do something to build your appetite for lunch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, maybe that's a good place to pause. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so I will see you soon, Martin, and hopefully everybody who's listening, watching, also, go well. <laughs>